All right, my name is Georgia Davenport. I'm the campaign director for Whole Washington. We are a grassroots organization, 100% unpaid, that is going to get single payer on the ballot here in Washington State. Washington is one of the 24 lucky states that has an initiative process that can circumvent the legislature. I am one of the many people in Washington State who is underinsured. Every time my daughter or myself goes to the ER, we have to pay 30% of the bill out of our pocket until we hit $5,000 for the year. This is quite a hardship for a family like mine. We already have a tough time saving money. This is why I'm volunteering for whole Washington. We need to provide everyone with health care. Co-pay free, no deductibles, regardless of their employment, health, or income. We are a 501c4. We have 13 board members, um, activists, doctors, union. We have Cindy Black, who is the head of 735. She's on our board. Vivian Kieha, she's our treasurer. Um, and Bill Moyer of the Backbone Campaign. Those are a few of our board members. We have hired Gerald Friedman, who is an economist at the University of um, Massachusetts at Hammerhurst, and he's agreed to do the funding study for whole Washington. So we can answer those important questions like, how are you going to pay for it? Whole Washington is very excited to work for him. He's completed many different funding studies for states like New York, Colorado, Massachusetts. Um, we have formed coalitions with local organizations and political leaders. Whole Washington would like to have more supporters too. We believe that healthcare professionals, unions, activists, and organizers should have a seat at the table now instead of after the petitions are written. How can you help? You can sign up to be an LD lead. We have a sign up form um, on the table in the front there. You can help us do data entry. We always need data entry. Um, you can sign up to do house parties for us. Um, and we also, of course, need donations. We need to hire a campaign director. Right now, I'm the interim campaign director. and like I said, volunteer. And we need to hire somebody who has a little bit more experience than I do. You can like and share our Facebook page and go to our website. Do we have time for questions? Or? Hi, I'm Ronnie Shore, and I'm a 43rd District Democrat. I am active in a citizen advocacy group called Healthcare for All Washington. Uh, we have introduced a bill in the House and in the Senate. Our prime sponsor in the House has been Sherry Appleton, and the prime sponsor originally in the Senate was Jean Cole Wells, but the recent introduction in the 2017-2018 biennium, uh, the prime sponsor is David Frocht. Our bill is called the Washington Health Security Trust to set up uh, a group uh, within the state to uh, create and to pull together all the hundreds of different healthcare financing programs that are going on and to make an offer to include everybody. Uh, we have a program director, a three field workers in eastern Washington, in, uh, in Yakima, and in Vancouver, and we have the program director here, communication intern, and we are planning to get hearings in the House in 2018. And in the Senate, we've talked with active members and leaders in both groups, and things are happening. It's not just editorials in the newspaper. It's real grassroots work that is showing up and some very receptive legislators. Uh, the other point I want to make is that we have a four-year strategic plan to get uh, this through the House and Senate in Washington, or by 2020, which is an election year, we are working with other states who are doing the same things so that we introduce a initiative in that year by 2020 and working with other groups that are doing that so that the f people that are trying to sabotage and create barriers for the program won't be able to pinpoint Colorado. They'll have states up and down the west coast and all across trying to put a program together. Uh, we do have our annual meeting coming up November 4th, uh, and I have some flyers about that. Uh, our keynote speaker is uh, Carmen Mendez, who's the deputy 
mayor of Yakima. Thank you. Healthcare for all Washington. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting us all to uh, speak here. Uh, my name is Jim Squire. I'm a practicing physician uh, here in Seattle, and I'm here representing uh, United for Single Payer, which is a, a grassroots uh, activist group which has been supporting single payer uh, since 2009. Um, we have a monthly meeting where we go into depth on a particular issue, and we also plan for um, activities in the community uh, along with other organizations. So I'm supposed to talk about uh, what is our position on single payer uh, at the state and national levels. So uh, on the national level, there are two bills uh, in Congress. Uh, one is H.R. 676 in the House of Representatives, which is uh, the Improved and Expanded Medicare for All Act, which is John Conyers is the sponsor of that. Uh, and there's 120 Democrat co-sponsors, so more than half of the Democrats in the House have uh, supported that. Uh, we fully support this bill, and it is the primary uh, focus uh, of our work. And um, in our opinion, um, it is the clearest path to single payer. Uh, for us, this is essentially the gold standard uh, for, uh, for work on single payer. Uh, also on the national level, there was the recently introduced uh, Senate Bill 1804, which is uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, Medicare for All Act, which has 16 Democrat co-sponsors. Uh, we welcome this uh, bill as a true Medicare for All bill, but in its current form, we do not uh, support it uh, because it is much weaker than H.R. 676 and it is fatally flawed as currently written. Um, we will use it to uh, create an opening uh, to advance the discussions around Medicare for All with um, our senators and um, their staff and the public, and we hope that the bill will be improved um, in, in the future. Unfortunately, it was not a companion bill to H.R. 676, which is what we were hoping for. On the state level, uh, there is the WIST, uh, which Ronnie uh, described, and there is also the work of Whole Washington, which is working towards uh, uh, a initiative to the public uh, for having them endorse a single-payer bill in, in, the, in the state. Uh, and we support and participate in both of these state efforts, um, even though this is not our primary focus uh, because um, they enhance the overall movement for single payer and um, they both work to educate the public. My time is up. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stand up because otherwise you might not hear me well. Uh, I'm David McClanahan. I'm a retired surgeon. I worked for 25 years at PacMed, and during that time, I worked a half a day a week each at Country Doctor and International District Clinic, where I set up uh, surgery clinics. So I have a long experience dealing with the uh, uninsured and underserved. Um, when I retired 12 years ago, I'm working harder now than I was when I was a full-time surgeon, uh, I co-founded the uh, Western Washington Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. It's a national organization of over 20,000 members. Our main focus is on national legislation. Uh, Jim mentioned the two single-payer bills out there now. We support Bernie Sanders' bill, but do think that uh, H.R. 676 in the House is much stronger, but Sanders has opened up a huge space with his campaign, so people know what single-payer Medicare for All is now, a, a lot more people than before Bernie's campaign. So we feel like at this point in time, we've got a whole lot more people out in the streets. We've got, look at uh, Washington State, we've got Indivisible and whole Washington that we didn't have a couple years ago that are strong single-payer supporters. So. We're pushing the national legislation, but we understand that healthcare 
involves uh, all sorts of the other social justice organizations and we have to work together. We have to get the people who know how to do grassroots organizing and direct action to work with people who are more comfortable with policy and electoral politics. So I think that's about enough for right now. Hopefully there will be questions because a lot of people say, well, single payer, it's not politically feasible at this point in time and blah, blah, blah. We hear that from politicians all the time. They say, yes, I'm a single payer supporter, but we've got other things we've got to deal with and that's for later. Just, But we believe that to really get where we need to be with health care as a human right, we need to transform the system from a for-profit uh, private insurance model to a public system where everybody is involved, every resident of this country from birth till death. Hi, I'm Jessica Goldman and I'm here on behalf of Indivisible North Seattle and we support all of the above. Um, at the moment we're dealing with the dumpster fires which are coming from Washington DC and so I want to just briefly tell you a couple and one of them is hot off the presses. Um, the first as you may know that the ACA enrollment period for people who are not yet insured um, by the ACA is November 1st through, the, through December 15th. Uh, the Trump administration has cut advertising and has taken the phone lines down so and has shrunk the enrollment period. We we have uh, created a flyer that we're distributing in libraries all over town and um, I'm going to send it to Viv so you guys if you want to make copies of it and just post it on your Facebook or you know your, your groups please do so um, we also have it in Spanish um, the news tonight um, as you know there was an executive order signed by President Trump last week in which he um, ended the CSRs which are the cost-sharing reduction uh, reimbursements by the federal government to insurance companies to compensate them for the reduced uh, rates that they have to uh, give to low-income people uh, to reimburse for deductibles and copays and out-of-pockets which they do on the front in and then the federal government reimburses. So that has, he terminated that. Um, and immediately a lawsuit was filed the next day and there are uh, 19 states attorney generals who are bringing that lawsuit. It's, um, it's uh, in the Northern District of California and Washington is a party to that lawsuit. And so I'm expecting that there should be a motion for injunctive relief immediately on that. But tonight, um, our own Senator Patty Murray and Senator Alexander, Republican, uh, came up with an agreement which has 70, per 70 votes in the Senate um, to um, create a stopgap resolution um, for the CSR funding issue. It doesn't solve the problem, and it's a, a messy compromise. But what it does um, is it allows for funding of these CSRs for two years to put off for two seasons, two insurance seasons, the catastrophe that would be happening happening without them. Um, the downside for us is that the, the ACA regulations um, would be um, waived in some circumstances. Um, there would be um, a, allowing of catastrophic plans for many more people, which um, creates a, an issue where there are not enough healthy people in the pool um, for everybody else. Um, but advertising money would be restored and doubled. Um, there would be explicit protections for low-income people and people people with serious illnesses. Trump has indicated tonight that he supports it. So we expect that this will pass the Senate. The question is the House of Representatives where um, there is a lot of uh, of concern that it might not pass. So our efforts right now, as of two hours ago, are directed squarely at the House of Representatives and to thank Patty Murray for her staying with this despite all of the, the, the turns this has taken. Um, and so we um, urge people to reach out to the House members of our delegation in the state of Washington um, and to reach out to people, particularly in red states that you know, who you can lobby to get them to lobby their own members of the, of Congress in the House. It is the policy of Indivisible that we not call representatives who do not represent us because it has an effect of watering down the voices of the people who actually are represented in 
in that district when they see the 206 area code showing up. Um, but do reach out to the people you know in states where there are uh, red representatives. Um, I will also say that um, the House is in recess this week, so this is a great time to kind of mobilize so that when Paul Ryan and his friends come back next week, they have a clear sign from us that this needs to happen. It's not perfect by any means. The, the Democrats are having to step back on ACA protections, but it's a compromise, um, and it's frankly the best we can do at the moment short of an injunction. Thank you. I'm also going to stand, and I am Nicole Macri, and also a proud 43rd District Democrat and your state representative. Um, and I wanted to uh, give you all an update and make an ask of you um, to, for action to take. Uh, so there is a lot of momentum building around expanding coverage um, and thinking more about you, what the path to universal coverage, healthcare coverage in Washington can look like. Um, and there are a number of things, um, some of which you heard about. So there are um, a, a couple of bills um, to um, do uh, um, what's called the Health Security Trust, which would be uh, broad universal coverage, what we often call single payer. Um, I do want to say we have some recent polling that was done, I think, over the summer that shows that people don't know what the heck single payer is, so we should really try to not use that um, phrase anymore. Um, but that Medicare for All is polling really, really strongly across Washington straight, State, both amongst Democrats and Republicans. Um, at well over um, majority. So over 65% of Washingtonians um, want us to um, have a universal coverage um, strategy that includes a single payer or single purchaser. Um, so we have to work on the branding. So Health Security Trust um, is a good example of that. Um, so those bills remain in play in Washington state. Um, there is building momentum around um, public option bills, per specifically Medicaid buy-in bills um, that um, would, that we could potentially implement more quickly. Um, and a number of members in the House and Senate are um, interested in that. As Ronnie said earlier, we are working hard to get a hearing on the two bills in the House and Senate, um, the Health Security Trust. Um, we expect there will be uh, hearings as well on Medicaid buy-in options. Um, and what I want to ask you all to do is to make sure you're talking to people in other districts um, to make sure that their representatives are aware of all of these bills and that um, there is urgency um, for us to have, a, have hearings on these bills during our short session, that these are priority um, policy issues for all Washingtonians. Um, I am carrying a bill that I um, prime sponsored in 2017 that I hope will get um, a hearing in 2018 to expand Apple Health for Kids um, to bring um, some parity um, for kids up to age 26 um, who currently are not eligible for Medicaid or are not on their parents' health insurance. Um, yeah. So this is an important bill, particularly for um, immigrants in our state. Um, and Washington has set a, a big example for many years in making sure when we say universal coverage, we mean universal coverage and coverage for everyone. Um, and so I'm hoping that all of these bills um, will um, get a hearing and get some movement um, through the legislature this year. Um, I think we're so grateful to Patty Murray, um, and I'll say one thing in that um, bill that was dropped today could potentially make it easier for us to get the required waivers we need to move things um, from the federal government to expand um, universal coverage. So um, we're going to Q&A. So I'll pass the mic to whom? To Vivian. To Vivian. <laughs> Any questions? Linda. First of all, thank you all. The question to um, my representatives and actually, what are the bill numbers you're talking about? Repeat the question. What are the bill numbers? 
So I don't have the bill numbers off the top of my head right now, but I'll tell you the prime sponsors. So um, uh, the Health Security Trust bill, um, prime sponsor in the House is Sherry Appleton. Um, I do know the bill number there, which is um, HB 1026. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, the prime sponsor in the Senate of that bill is David Frocht, and that one is 5701. Um, uh, the Medicaid expansion buy-in bill, um, the prime sponsor in the Senate is Patty Kuderer, and the prime sponsor in the House is Marcus Riccelli. I'm sorry, I don't have those bill numbers off the top of the head. And my bill number on the um, Apple Health um, expansion is um, HB 1565. Any other questions? Jesse? I was hoping you could speak to um, what your concerns are with um, the uh, Senate um, Senate bill as compared with the House bill. What makes what makes the House bill better, et cetera? Uh, how much time do I have for this? <laughs> well, let me just give you the down and dirty here. Um, uh, the uh, Ber Bernie Sanders bill has no provision for long-term care, which is a big deal. So long-term care will be left in Medicaid, which means that you have to become impoverished in order to get it. And that is really a violation of human rights. And it's, I mean, there's just no reason for it. Um, Bernie Sanders' bill has a transition period of four years, um, which if you ever have a chance to read the bill, is the most complicated transition I've ever seen. It is like way more complicated than the Affordable Care Act, and it involves the exchanges, uh, private insurance, Medicaid buy-ins, uh, public options for uh, Medicare in the exchanges. It's, it's, it would be a disaster and um, it'll just be totally trashed by the Republicans as being something that's completely unworkable. And I, th I think that's one of the things that makes it uh, uh, fatally flawed. Um, the uh, uh, Bernie's bill allows for investor-owned providers of care, um, uh, which uh, they will all be eliminated in the H.R. 676 bill. Um, the idea being that uh, health care is a right, health care should be a public good, um, that should not be uh, not for profit. Basically, you run it like the fire department. Um, you just, you know, they have a budget and they run it. You get a card, you need to care, you go and get it. Um, and that nobody should be making a profit off it. Uh, there are no global budgets for hospitals or large providers, which is like a big deal because this is a tremendous source of savings by giving hospitals and large providers um, global budgets so they just have, just like the fire department, you give them say, okay, here's $10 million, run your fire department. Uh, but hospitals, because they don't have that, they have to bill for every Band-Aid and Tylenol that you get, and the whole thing becomes so complex and expensive, it just, it, it, you know, it gets to be absurd. And also, uh, there is no uh, separation of the budgets for hospitals and large uh, healthcare organizations between their operating budgets and their capital budgets. Um, and this would lead to tremendous overexpense and um, uh, it, it'll just be ver make it very difficult to plan uh, for the, the health care in a community. Um, there's small co-payments that are allowed um, for me some medications under Santa's bill and that's a minor thing. Um, and is, is more unclear about the eligibility of the undocumented in Bernie Sanders' bill as compared with H.R. 676, it says all residents uh, get coverage. And it's somewhat unclear in Bernie Sanders' bill. The one thing that Sanders' bill is better in is in women's health care uh, because it will abolish the Hyde Amendment, uh, which gets in the way of uh, abortions, so that the federal government can't fund abortion. And that is, it's, it's, it's clearly better. And, uh, than uh, H.R. 676. So those are some of the things, but you can see it's a lot. Thank you, Jim. Other questions? I'm sorry, we, we really
really need a, a Bluetooth mic. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Um, when Group Health was founded, its founders were ardent supporters of a national health care system. Uh, that was long ago, and much has happened since then. Of course, now it's part of Kaiser Permanente, but I, the question is, has Kaiser Permanente taken a stand on any of these bills? Are they supporting them? Who would like to ask? As far as I know, I don't think they have, and I think they're afraid to ask their constituents or their patients, patients they cover about it. Uh, within the s national single-payer bills, Kaiser Permanente would still be Kaiser Permanente, and the funds, national funds, national insurance would be given to Kaiser Permanente to, you know, they'd be given a lump sum for their budget, but as Jim said, the capital budget is separate, and the capital budget is where patients or empire building goes on among the, the hospital centers. They want to, everybody wants to have their latest MRI and so on, so you can get a place like Seattle within a, one city there's, you know, 30 or 40 MRIs and out in the countryside you got to go 50 miles to get one or more. So in a rational, efficient system, the, the technology like that would be spread around based on the need. At the same time, Kaiser Permanente and every hospital in the state of Washington has come to the support of those cutbacks in advertising for the health benefit exchange for the extension of the Affordable Care Act because it certainly benefits them and reduces the charity care that they were often stuck with. They are big supporters of moving action forward. They are on the forefront. And even insurance companies are not as much a barrier as we wanted. Their hidden agenda is if healthy people buy in health insurance, if everyone is involved, it's good for them because that's how insurance pays for itself. I think I saw your hand up first. Well, personally, I think I'd support it because it's a incremental thing in the right direction, but it's not going to transform the system because it's going to be just another marketplace solution, you know, within our, our for-profit system. But it, if it's implemented well, then it can cover people who would not otherwise be covered until we get to where we really need to be. I, I agree with that, but I would say that it distracts in some ways from the, where the effort really should be. Even just on a statewide level, it's a very, um, it's still an incoherent plan to have single payer uh, as opposed to nationally. And we want something, and so we're totally supportive of whole Washington, and if that's what we can get, we want that. But then to bring it down to a city level, it, it makes it even more incoherent, and how to force people, and where would they buy it, and who, you know, would it be where, where you're employed, where you're domiciled, um, and it wouldn't have the benefits um, that really would be demonstrable, at least at the state level, and certainly at the national level. So I'll just echo that and I'll just say on the other end, I know that there are many stakeholders who are engaged in multi-state conversations, uh, a, kind of a West Coast coalition of states, of democratic states looking at um, options. Um, and the thing to keep in mind, the bigger we go, the better it is. A national health plan is, is the best strategy. Um, but uh, in lieu of that, we, we have to move forward on something. Go Cascadia. Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, this comes up all the time, United for Single Payer, because there's certain people that come there that are in support of this. Uh, we would support it. Um, 
But it would be, it's a stopgap measure. It's because you can't get it at the state level, you can't get it at the national level, so we're like, what can you do? And it would achieve universality, at, at least in the city, so it would achieve something. And so we would support it if, if, if nothing else was working. I feel like I'm going to move the gavel. Okay. So um, one of the things that we are doing is going out to um, legislative district organizations and other different stakeholder organizations and asking them now, before the initiative is even complete, to have a seat at the table. So we've contacted disability organizations, homeless advocates, um, Indivisible, our revolution, like, basically you know, all these organizations we've been talking to as well. Um, but if you have a specific organization that you think should have a seat at the table, take one of our flyers and we will get to you once we have the initiative kind of drafted and we want your, we want your input now so that later on we're not saying, well, we have this initiative written, it might be problematic, but you have to get on board because it's set in stone. We don't want that. Oh yeah, so we have a board member. We have board members all over the state, but um, one of our board members is a state committee woman. I think she's county, I can't remember, but Susan Palmer in Yakima. And she's been reaching out to them. What's that? <laughs> she's been reaching out to the migrant workers and the unions over in Yakima. Um, we've, our initiative writing committee chair is really great at um, doing a lot of that outreach. She's in Spokane. So we've been really trying to focus on getting those stakeholders to come talk to us and tell us what's important to them so that we're sh assured that that's in the initiative. And then they have ownership and buy-in so that later they might want to volunteer for us to gather some signatures. Can I, can I add one thing to that? Uh, we've talked about barriers to Medicare for all, but Washington State is one of the most active uh, states in doing that, and the Washington State Labor Council has really been a center to pull all of us together, and they have brought in a number of uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, and and migrant workers and, and 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 groups like that. We have a really powerful support. So where Colorado initiative failed because they didn't have support from groups like that. We have really gotten that support in Washington State. Thank you. If we do institute this, what are the legal barriers that make it so we can't implement? Yeah. When I'm not indivisible, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Um, the question is, what are the legal barriers? Um, and I think um, in the state of Washington, we have a very clear legal barrier. And it's because um, the state taxation, um, the power of taxing was held unconstitutional in the 1930s. And so the, the tax that's being implemented now by the city of Seattle is going to is facing immediate legal challenge. And it'll probably be the vehicle that ends up at the Washington State Supreme Court for an income tax. Um, and um, we need to have the 1930s decision struck down and we need to have um, the Supreme Court recognize that, th the, that our Constitution certainly allows for this type of a tax because it will be the backbone um, for a single-payer system. So that's at the state level. Um, at the fed That's correct. I know we definitely recently had a um, discussion about covering um, 
sex change. Uh, sorry. <laughs> What's right? Gender. Sorry. <laughs> Tell me the correct. Oh, trans healthcare. So any sort of surgery that needs to happen, we want to make sure that all of that is covered in any single payer system that we introduce. And so our initiative writing committee has definitely reached out to um, the trans community to ensure that that's covered. Yeah, definitely. If you, the group that you recommended, if you could, if you could give me their um, information afterwards, Gender Justice League. Okay. Okay. Well, if, you're, if everyone in the country is covered from birth until death for any uh, medical needs, you wouldn't have to worry about L&I anymore. Yeah, because to appeal to small business rather than having Yes. Right. Well, there's definitely very strong uh, evidence that business would do much better under a single-payer system, a national health system. And there's uh, business leaders that are out there making films. You've probably seen the film uh, Fix It. If you haven't, you should see that. It's by um, the guy who is the CEO of the largest picture frame company in the country, uh, uh, Buffett, and his partner have just recently said single payer is the way to go because uh, our healthcare system is a tapeworm on industry. So things are looking up across the board. So. We're on our way. So, so if you have any connections with the business community, we are trying to, at our Indivisible, we are taking this awesome little movie called Fix It, and we'd like to present it to business organizations. We'd like to present it to chambers of commerce, to rotary clubs, you know, those folks who always are looking for some interesting healthcare stuff to hear about over their lunches. And it's, uh, there's, it's a 35, 40 minute film, and we'd like, and it's addressed to business people. Fix It is about business people, how, 30% of the expense can be saved for businesses under a single payer system. So if any of you have ideas for how we can plug into an organization that's already up and running and that services the business community, I'd love to hear your, your suggestions. Okay. Well, I think we're just out of time. Um, I'd love to thank all of our uh, panelists for being here. Um, this was awesome.